talking to you about food safety risks associated with different systems that you know uh, that we have and um, some of them are uh, the risks food safety risks are greater and some of them are uh, short or smaller but anyway she's going to tell you all about it and we can um, if the room was is it are people are you guys comfortable is it too cold in here or too no it's okay Okay, I'm just me, cold, so we can close this door then. No. <laughs> okay. okay, so I think um, Susan's handing out the packet of material I have for you all, and I'm sorry that it's not in the workshop or you know, school material that you already have. But what I did was I have a copy of the presentation I'm going to give today, and then when I'm talking, I'm going to go through these extra documents, and so they're in order in there of what I'll be talking about. So if you want to look at them and follow along, because sometimes they're hard to see on the PowerPoint presentation. So as Alina said, I um, work in the food science department in this building, and my expertise is in food safety. Um, my background is in environmental health sciences and water quality, so I deal a lot with understanding how pathogens and microorganisms move within the environment. So within water, within air, within soil. So I'm, I want to try to kind of translate a little bit of that to you all today. And what I'm gonna do is really talk a little bit more about pathogens than maybe you're usually used to and introduce you to why they're an issue mm -hmm. and then go through some of the sources of contamination and how pathogens um, can enter those different sources. And then Elena mentioned that I will be going through some aspects of certain production systems that may be more susceptible to contamination than others. Although we have planned a little bit more of that for the next phase of this project to really assess the risk with each system. So I'll go ahead and get started. And please feel free to ask any questions along the way. I prefer that. Um, it makes me feel like you're actually listening and engaged as well. So. Okay, so um, first, I know some of you are in the previous talk I gave, and this is going to be way more extensive and informative, I hope. So um, I just like to introduce the idea of how many outbreaks are related to berries. How many have been related to berries? Um, a lot of people may think strawberries, they're not associated with food safety or foodborne outbreaks. Why should we be concerned? Well, in the past 13 years, there have been 18 berry-related outbreaks in North America. It doesn't seem like a lot, but that's about one per year. Well, not 13 years, I'm sorry, 23 years. It's about one per year. And so these have been an issue. And when I say berries, I mean not just strawberries, but blackberries, raspberries, all different types of berries. And the reason why berries can be easily contaminated is because they're minimally processed and they're often handled a lot during um, harvest. And in addition, they're often sprayed with pesticides or fungicides right before harvest, and sometimes that quality of water may be um, questionable in the past. Now that we have these new gaps and everyone's kind of following these food safety plans, it may not be as much of an issue. And often berries are imported, so a lot of these outbreaks may be from imported berries and not necessarily domestic U.S. grown berries, just to say that. Okay. So quickly, like I said, we're going to talk about microorganisms because I really think it's important for people to understand the differences in the microorganisms that may be present in the environment and how they may behave differently. I'm not going to get too sciencey, but I just think it's important to understand these differences. So there's three different categories of contaminants that you all are probably aware of. You have protozoa, viruses, and bacteria. Um, bacteria are your E. coli's that you hear about, salmonella, viruses, hepatitis A virus, norovirus, protozoa such as cryptosporidium and cyclospora, which are not as well known or common that we hear about, but there have been major outbreaks due to them. The other thing about these contaminants that is important are the size of the microorganism. So protozoa are fairly large microbes and the bacteria are a little smaller, and viruses are much, much smaller. And I'm mentioning this now because this is important when you think about treatment of your water source, if you do treat a water source that may require that. Um, if you apply a filtration method, 
it's important to know what your contaminants are because if your filter has a pore size that's larger than a virus and you're trying to control for viruses, that virus is going to go right through it. Okay, so it's important to realize that there's a lot of different microbes in different sizes. The other thing are their resistance to environmental degradation and chemical inactivation, which I'll talk about a little bit more too. So bacteria are pretty wimpy in the environment for the most part. <laughs> um, and so they degrade more rapidly than say protozoa or viruses. Um, again, for chemical inactivation, bacteria in general are easily inactivated by chlorine or UV disinfection, whereas protozoa and viruses are much more resistant. Okay. So with respect to berries, the primary contaminants of concern or that have been of concern or that have caused outbreaks are your bacteria E. coli, so sugar toxin and non sugar toxin producing, and I'm going to talk a little bit more in depth about what that means exactly. Salmonella, viruses such as hepatitis A virus and human norovirus, and protozoa cyclospora. So a lot about, let's say, of the 18 outbreaks, 14 have been due to viruses and protozoa. Okay, and an important aspect of this is these are specific to human fecal contamination. So where you have these other bacteria up here that are, can be from a lot of different reservoirs, animals, uh, domestic animals, wildlife, you name it, they can carry it. So here, it's actually kind of easy. You're thinking, what I have to control is human fecal contamination. Okay, up here, it's like, well, there's a lot of different reservoirs that I, I, I have to consider. Okay, so I'm going to go into a little bit more in depth on E. coli. So as you probably know, most strains are harmless. Uh, we um, have E. coli in our intestinal tract. It is perfectly fine. We are fine. Um, that is our generic non-pathogenic E. coli. But then you have pathogenic E. coli. And the big fuss lately and over the past 10, 20 years are sugar toxin producing E. coli. So when people say sugar toxin producing, basically is exactly what it means. It produces a toxin that can cause an increase in the pathogen's ability to cause, uh, I would say, more severe symptoms. So E. coli infects us by specifically binding to our intestinal cell, our intestinal wall. And then once it's there, these sugar toxins are produced and they enter the bloodstream. And so once they're in our bloodstream, they inhibit our immune response, they cause cell death, and then you can end up going into what the problem is with people who get infected with sex, is hemolytic uremic syndrome, which is basically where your kidneys are failing. So this is kind of the flow of what can happen and why when you do have an outbreak caused by sex, it can be so severe. Um, and then, of course, with your, you have non sex that are also pathogenic, and basically they're just infecting the intestines and causing gastrointestinal stress. So, diarrhea, abdominal cramps, etc. And so, this is the basic breakdown of E. coli, the difference between sex and non sex. So, what about these animal reservoirs of sex? Do they get sick? You would think if they are reservoirs and they're carrying these organisms that cause us to get sick, why aren't they getting sick? Well, you have to have specific receptors, and we are unfortunate enough to have these receptors that the E. coli can bind to and reproduce. However, ruminants, those that mostly carry your sex, your deer, cow, goats, sheep, they don't have these receptors. So this is a lovely environment for these sex to take up, you know, residence in, and colonize and reproduce and then be released back into the environment when these animals defecate. So they can live in these ruminants without causing infection and they also can form biofilms. And like I said, they can just colonize and be there for the long term. That's why there's such an issue because if the animals were getting sick and it was causing an issue with production, industry would be doing something about that, but it doesn't. So it's considered what you call a commensal bacteria for these, um, for these animals. Salmonella. So it's one of the most common bacterial causes of diarrhea in the US. 
I can say with almost 99% certainty, salmonella has been associated with, uh, you go from fruits to vegetables to meat to uh, milk, they have been associated with all sorts of outbreaks. They are ubiquitous. There are 2,500 different serotypes or serovars of salmonella. And so um, I thought this was interesting because these, and funny, because <laughs> these different produce, jalapenos, uh, tomatoes, onion, pepper. This was, there was a salsa outbreak. And so no one could really figure out where the salmonella was coming from because all of these fresh produce products have been implicated in the past. So it's really difficult to weed that out. <clears throat> so some sources of salmonella, and this will get at why it's so hard sometimes to control for it. So most time you think of raw eggs, poultry, pork, and beef products. But with that said, Poultry, pork, and beef are also produced in animal operations, also produce a lot of waste that is then either land applied in the environment. Um, sometimes in, in say pork produ production, you have huge lagoons of waste, if not managed properly, can get out. So these are huge reservoirs of salmonella that can get, then get into the environment, into our soil, into our water sources, and then potentially come into contact with your fresh produce production. Reptiles and amphibians, um, they're a huge source. Every year I think I hear or read about an outbreak related to kids who have pet turtles and <laughs> getting sick because of salmonella. And again, salmonella is just a regular commensal bacteria for these. So um, those are very big sources. Wild birds are another big source. Um, and basically it all comes down to these animals defecating and contaminating water. Um, obviously, uh, if you have septic tanks or a sewage treatment plant that may be not operating at optimal, um, optimal performance, you can have contamination of water that way. And then also, another source of salmonella that kind of feeds this cycle is actually animal feed itself. The feed that these animals are eating often contain animal byproducts that often contains salmonella. So it's kind of a vicious cycle. Um, again, it's just a common part of all animal and birds, so it's, it's really hard to control. And most of the time, the reason why people get sick with salmonella is just improper handling of their food product. So if the food is cooked, fine. But if they're not handling it properly in the kitchen or there's cross-contamination, that's when you get the issue. And again, it goes back to, say, berries and fresh produce that are minimally processed and don't go through a heat treatment step, that's when you have the issue. Hepatitis A virus, I'll go over briefly. Um, this again is another one that would be an imported, usually from an imported food, but it can also come from field workers um, who come from countries where hepatitis A virus is endemic or very common in that country. And so I just show this map where obviously in the US, hepatitis A prevalence is very, very low. But then you have all these other countries where it's very, very high. And so we get a lot of produce from some of these countries. Um, and that's how it's been imported in the past. Um, so endemic in the developing world. Uh, while infections in our countries are less common, some of the symptoms, and I'm going to mention the symptoms specific, specifically for this one, because this is important for when you're able to control or when you finally figure out that, hey, there may be an issue with hepatitis A virus. Um, with your bacteria, you have a very short incubation period before you get sick. So maybe three days, five days. So you can sometimes associate, oh, you know, three days ago or a couple days ago, I ate these things. And so you can kind of figure it out. Whereas with hepatitis A virus, you have a really long incubation period. And sometimes that product has been eaten or been sold, distributed, eaten, and there's nothing you can do about it. So outbreaks are commonly associated with shellfish and fresh produce. The common denominator here is water. So shellf shellfish, if the, the harvesting waters or the, the growing waters that they're in is contaminated, that's how they um, can get, in, get uh, hepatitis <coughs> virus. And then fresh produce is the same way. And also, again, your field workers. <clears throat> human norovirus. So who knows about, has heard about human norovirus before? Anyone? Yeah. Heard of it. Heard of it. Yeah. So the next slide I'm going to show you is kind of why we know about it. So um, cruise ships are probably the biggest 
publicity maker for norovirus. Um, but it's, so 90% of viral illnesses on cruise ships are caused by this virus. But I will say that actually uh, 50, I think it's like 58% of all foodborne illnesses in the US are also caused by norovirus. So it's a huge issue. And it's been related to, um, I think, three, two or three of those bear related outbreaks that I told you about has, that have happened over the past 23 years. Okay, so some roots of, of transmission for human norovirus. So with most pathogens, you have a fecal oral route. So it's ingested, it comes out the other end, and then it gets contaminated, then you ingest it, and, and the cycle begins. Um, so contaminated food, water, person to person. Environmental camp contamination, such as water, soil, fomite, so your hard surfaces, um, people's hands. Uh, aerosolization of vomit, and I'm mentioning this because if you some reason had an incident in a bathroom facility that was related on your uh, was located on your farm and someone vomited that right there is almost a guarantee that you're going to have an outbreak with ever whoever is using that facility because these droplets can go pretty much everywhere um, they've done some studies studies using like a, a compound that glows and uh, <laughs> and if you simulated an event in the toilet and flushed it uh, turn the lights off, put a black light on, and everything is glowing. So <laughs> whenever something like that happens, you need to think, I need to clean more than a toilet. I need to clean every aspect of this facility. It's very easily transmitted. Um, because the number of viruses you need to cause infection is very, very low. So you need about 20 to 100. Um, whenever you are sick with norovirus, you shed about one billion viruses in one gram of diarrhea. So if, if you have diarrhea and um, and you're and you're having it in the, wherever it is, the likelihood of you contaminating um, surfaces and, and possibly coming in contact with other people and contaminating or infecting them is very very high, just because this infectious dose is so low. And I should say with bacteria, like your salmonellas, you're talking about you may need 10,000 to 100,000 bacterial cells to cause infection. And so viruses are an issue because you don't have to have quite as many to cause an infection. So the person cleaning the bathroom can just about count on getting sick, I guess? Yes, I actually proposed um, you know, you should really wear some personal protective equipment when you're cleaning a bathroom. But it's it's really the most important thing, and I'm going to talk about this later, is hand washing. You can pretty much prevent about anything if you just really wash your hands the proper way and don't use hand sanitizer. Okay, um, so I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, high rate of secondary transmission because of this, and so once it gets on one person and then uh, in your family, it'll just spread right through everyone. The other aspect of norovirus is immunity. Um, it only lasts a few months, and it's similar to the flu. It's not the flu because it's not a respiratory virus, but it's similar because you have a new strain that circulates every year. And so if you get sick one time, that does not mean you're not going to get sick again. So, um, And I just wanted to point out this recent outbreak. Um, this was this is 2014, but it's actually 2013. There is the largest outbreak in German history caused by imported strawberries from China. It caused 11,000, at least 11,000 cases of norovirus. And these were mostly in schools and childcare facilities, and they were from frozen strawberries, but because of the way the frozen strawberries were prepared, they weren't heated to a high enough temperature, they were still able to cause illnesses. And the thought is that this is actually due to a contaminated water source. Okay, so last organism that has been um, highly linked to berries, um, Cyclospora, and they, this one pathogen alone caused seven out of the 18 outbreaks in the past 23 years. And it is all due to imported um, berries. <clears throat> but um, if you do have any help on the farm that, where the person is coming from, a country where this pathogen is endemic, that could be another reservoir. So
So primary ingestion of contaminated food and water, um, psychosporiasis is common in con many countries, mostly tropical and subtropical though, so you're talking, you know, right by the equator. Um, sources imported foods and food handlers. And so this is just to show all of the, the food products that have been implicated, uh, fresh imported strawberries, basil, snow peas, lettuce, um, they've all been implicated in, in outbreaks of psychospora. So um, I always like to show this set of slides because I think it helps to put things in perspective. So these organisms in perspective. So how small are these guys? So this is the tip of a pin. You get a little closer and you have a human hair here. And then this is a dust mite. Right, okay. So we can't see any, we can't see that with our naked eye. Um, keep going in a little further. You have pollen, a lymphocyte, a blood cell, yeast, keep going, E. coli, staphylococcus, which is, we've all heard of staph before. Um, Ebola virus, which we don't have to worry about in this country, thank goodness. And uh, rhinovirus, which is the common cold. And so these viruses that I'm talking about are like this size. So, so how do berries become contaminated? So sources, the sources of contamination. So we'll go. I'm going to go through all of these and look at some of the checklists and the logs and, and um, sheets that are provided through uh, the California. Strawberry Commission, but also through the National um, Good Agricultural Practices Program at Cornell. Okay, so um, irrigation water, water use for mixing pesticides, wildlife and animal intrusion, and I know there's talk about this later about exclusion, so I'm going to talk about why it's an issue for the initial intrusion onto your land, uh, field workers, and then packing and storage containers. So first we'll go to soil and compost. So I'm, I'm gonna, I'll hold up the page I'm talking about whenever I get to it. Um, let me just pull this up. Okay, so a lot of this is coming from the California Strawberry Commission and they have a whole document on strawberry production food safety. I put the link at the end of the um, presentation so you can download the PDF, but I did print out specific forms from there as examples of how you could design a food safety plan or log for each of these different aspects of your production system. Um, and I also switch back and forth between the GAP, National GAPS program because I think some of their forms are actually more user friendly. Um, I think the forms from the California Strawberry Commission are for very large production systems. So uh, maybe not quite as applicable. So soil, soil and compost. So you should really know your soil and you need to document it. Pretty much every aspect of root safety and fresh produce production requires documentation, reporting, and keeping records. Um, basically, that's it. if you have a good plan and you have logs and records, you're probably going to be fine. So soil type. So knowing your soil type is going to dictate the type of drainage you're going to have on your field. Um, production history. So according to the California Strawberry Commission, um, they ask you, you know, do you, how many years have you been farming uh, using this land to uh, grow strawberries? And they say, if less than three, do you know previous crops and uses? So I wanted to look a little bit more in why they had a three year kind of, if less than three, then what do you know? Um, but I didn't find any information specifically in that document. Um, but I just assume it's a, probably a conservative uh, period of time to say if you had um, heavy animal use or uh, other type of manure or applications on the field and it's been less than three years, you may have an increased risk of having contamination or contaminants, microbial contaminants in your soil. Uh, know your previous, the previous and adjacent land uses. So um, around your farm, are there livestock production areas, cattle grazing areas, um, you know, poultry houses, etc. It's really good to understand what's going on around you. I think I have a question. Yeah. When you're talking about things around your farm, what's the distance we're talking about to become, to become contaminated from 
like a dairy operation or something? <laughs> well, I think it um, it depends on whether you're upstream or downstream, or upslope or downslope. Um, <clears throat> water sources as well that could potentially become contaminated with waste from that facility and that would somehow, if you had a flooding event, come onto your farm. Um, a friend of mine, and I was going to talk about this later, but I can talk about it now. My, my friend, a friend of mine and myself did some work in Yakima Valley, Washington, and they have a huge dairy industry. Um, but they also have a huge fresh produce production industry. They produce asparagus, they produce a lot of stone fruits, um, lots of other, I'm trying to think, well, they produce hops too, but that's not fresh produce. So anyhow, but, <laughs> but the point was, um, my colleague was analyzing bioaerosols from these dairy operations because um, they had huge piles of manure piled up around and they also had lagoon or, or waste kind of pits and then they have, um, you know, irrigation, a canal irrigation system that ran through the whole Yakima Valley. And so the study was to look at bioaerosols and what would happen, do these, um, these bioaerosols get suspended or potential contaminants get suspended from these uh, dairy feeding operations and then can they come into contact with people that are living in the area so could they be exposed and they did show that organisms can be detected <coughs> several miles away from these operations obviously the closer you are the more the higher the risk um, whether the levels were significant is still under question so you know, it's a really complex situation or answer because you're talking about wind and climatic things that can impact whether a nearby dairy operation is going to impact your fresh produce field. And was that all groundwater or airborne as well? That was, so I did groundwater testing and they had a huge issue in Yakima for, with nitrate, uh, increased levels of nitrate. Um, but we were able to find a lot of people's wells were contaminated with um, some increased levels of E. coli, which you normally wouldn't find in, you know, well constructed wells. Um, and so, yeah, so it was really just well water, surface water, and then aerosols that we looked at. So, and that was just in one location, but that's kind of an example of the thought process and. Um, this may be getting into a little too much, but you know, the EPA, I don't know, EPA along with USDA, there's been a question about regulating agriculture air quality, um, you know, because they do regulate urban air quality. And so, you know, there's a lot of pushback because it's like, how can you really control <laughs> agriculture air quality? But you do have these potential issues with um, microbial contaminants if you are in proximity to um, either hog operations, dairy, um, poultry not so much, but depending on where they're storing their litter can be an issue. So, okay. I can. I, I grew up around a lot of dairies and they used to irrigate with the rain herd sprinklers. And yes. You could smell. And I, I guess if I was going to be concerned, I would say if you can smell it, you got a problem. You know, the aromatics may be different than the, the bios that mm -hmm. you're talking about. But it, to me, it would be a rough rule of thumb. Yeah, I think that's a good rule of thumb. And, you know, the prevailing <coughs> and so on. And of course, a 50 mile an hour wind carries it a little bit farther than, than that. Yeah. I yeah. think significant contamination, though, would be more water for washing in on the farm. And of course, right. how much of that occurs depends on how the water comes. Is it coming down a ditch or is it running across a pasture? If it's going across the grass or through a buffer of some sort. Yeah. Well, those are all the things, yeah, you have to consider and realize, like, some of it's common sense, but some of it's also talking to, you know, your fellow farmers or local extension and being like, you know, what is the, is there an issue here or something I should be concerned about? But, yeah, those are all good points. So, um, so, so you should do soil testing or you can do soil testing. Um, especially when you're adding amendments like organic amendments, compost manure, um, <clears throat> and the things you need to think about are, you know, how much was used, when was it applied, how was it applied, and so I know the last time I gave this talk there was a question about soil testing, 
And I'm going to go through a little bit more um, in the next few slides. And, and I'll come back to the soil testing aspect. But you can test for obviously um, a lot of different uh, nutrients, and you can go beyond and do metals um, and also uh, fecal coliforms. And I'll talk about it in just, just a second. So, um, the reason why you test? Well, E. coli and salmonella can remain in manure slurry and soil for up to three months or more, depending on temperature and soil conditions. And as I was talking about, your viruses and protozoa, they can last even longer. Um, we, there's not a lot of data, there's some out there, but not a lot um, on the viruses and protozoa survival in, in fresh produce fields, and that's because the attention has always been on bacteria. Um, because you have most of the outbreaks are, or high profile outbreaks that are associated with those sugar toxin producing E. coli like I was talking about or salmonella. Um, you should avoid storing or applying co uh, compost near maturing crops. So um, National GAP says you should store uh, compost no closer than 30 feet from crops and 80 feet from a water source. Um, <clears throat> and similar to what we were talking about with animal uh, manure piles, you could have possible um, drift and deposition of microbes on your strawberries um, if it's uh, in close proximity and not and it's in an open field and not covered. So those are things to consider. Now, when, when you talk about compost, you're talking about composted manure as opposed to composted. It can be com well, so, yeah. So it can be a combination of things. Mm -hmm. It could be. Uh, you know, poultry litter, manure, leaves, kitchen waste, all composted, and it also depends on the system you use, which I'll talk about in just a second. So, <laughs> sorry for the mistype. Um, this is just kind of defining what composting is. Um, you should only use treated or cured compost. And, let me see if I have that sheet. No, okay. Um, so basically, you do this and have cured compost to minimize potential for microbial contamination. So the two systems I looked into and I'm more familiar with are your, you know, your big compost piles that are outside, windrow systems, and then closed systems. And so if you're in one that is an open system, you have to reach a temperature of 131 to 170 degrees Fahrenheit over a 15-day period to be considered cured. Um, and you have to turn it a minimum of five times. So the idea is that you know the outside part of the pile doesn't reach that temperature like the inside does, and so if you don't turn it, then the outside won't have that same inactivation rate of microorganisms as the inside. Um, and then you have enclosed systems where you would need to reach that temperature for a minimum of three days. So, um, and the other thing you should do, if you don't produce your own compost, uh, which is fine, um, you can ask the compost producer if you do use compost to provide documentation that shows a process that actually reduces pathogens. And so um, U.S. Composting Council has a whole seal of testing assurance and a, a list of tests that they say need to be done to say this compost, we can assure you that pathogens have been reduced if you do the process to say and run this test. Um, and so that's kind of... I think that's the next slide. Okay, so this is just a sh uh, to show you what one of the open or the window composting can be like. Obviously, some compost producers can have huge fields um, of these compost type piles. So when to test. It may be necessary if previous land uses um, have potential for microbial risk. So again, we've been talking about animal operations. Uh, either it had been used or was located near dairy operations, poultry farms, if you've had high um, spraying of manure. So um, as you were saying, like, and I saw this in Yakima, Yakima Valley too, they were just spraying the manure on all of these fields, like that were probably, it was corn or something like that. But if for some reason that one day got turned over and was starting to produce you know, fresh produce crops, it would be good to know. Um, after flooding, so what can happen is uh, a lot of microorganisms can particle associate, and so they'll attach to soil particles or in water sources, they'll, um, they'll drop down into the sediments. 
But if you have a flooding event, you have high flow of water and all of that gets resuspended. And so those microorganisms can be washed up and then um, um, get packed onto uh, your soil, your land, or um, compost. Uh, leakage or unusual runoff, you know, if you see a stream coming from somewhere that isn't a freshwater source, maybe of concern. <clears throat> when in using organic amendments, like I've been saying. So, I wanted to, there's a soil test example in this packet I gave you. And this is just from one of the labs. So I'm gonna list all the labs that are available to do um, soil testing. And I only, and I know we have a soil test and composting lab here at the University of Arkansas, but to my knowledge, they do not test for fecal coliforms or salmonella, which would be what you would want to have tested um, probably annually um, if you had some concern or if you are using compost that may contain you know, manure sources. And so on this sheet, um, they have a test like C1 and C2. Those are the ones that say S US, S US CC SGA. So that was the US Compost Council uh, seal of testing assurance. And so these are all of the all the different tests that they would run on a sample, and you see that it includes fecal coliform or salmonella in both of those. And then if you look a little further down to C16, they also have pathogen testing, and you can do E. coli, salmonella, and fecal coliforms. So this could just be done once per year before you start your um, planting, or if you had any concerns, or if you wanted to test your compost. And I'm showing this because I wanted to put in perspective where your fecal coliforms lie. So we talked a little bit about the pathogenic E. coli, the Stex, and then the generic E. coli, and then fecal coliforms. So most tests are gonna target here. And so if you get positive for fecal coliforms, you could have E. coli and pathogenic E. coli in that sample. Doesn't mean it's E. coli, but it could be. But I'm pointing this out because you have salmonella up here that would not be detected just using a fecal coliform test. Okay, so I think it's great that some of these labs do offer a salmonella or fecal coliform test. If it were me, I mean, if you really thought you had a potential input or reservoir of salmonella that was having access to your land, that would probably be the only reason I would test for it. You're gonna get much higher levels of uh, E. coli, or pathogenic E. coli, I would think. So, but they do give you options, which I think is great. Um, and so this is also another example. This is from Penn State. Uh, they have an agriculture uh, soil testing center. And again, you see they're testing, they're um, targeting just fecal coliforms. They don't really give you an option. And they don't have a separate test. So this is a package. Um, and this is Midwest Labs. And so this one actually has uh, you can do soil, sludge, or compost, and they give you a lot of different options for uh, microorganisms. You would want to target your E. coli, fecal coliforms, or salmonella. Total coliforms are not going to give you a lot of information, and they're normally reserved for uh, testing uh, potable water quality. Um, total coliforms, are, you saw, are pretty much encompassing, all encompassing. So you're going to find total coliforms almost inevitably, and they're not problematic. It's just they're not going to give you a lot of information about if you have microbial contamination, whereas your fecal coliforms, your E. coli, or your salmonella will. And then in your package, this is just a list of the labs um, from the composting council. And I looked at all the labs they listed, and these were the ones that actually offered microbial testing. A lot of them don't. So it was, you know, it was a little bit challenging to find. One you could add to that list is A and L labs over Memphis. They do this. Okay. They have a, a fusion for other uh, testing, not microbial, but it's fast turn around and good people work. Do they do microbial testing? Yeah, okay. Do. That's good to know. Okay. Because they I didn't see them on their list, so maybe I should tell them to put them on the list so people know about they're, them. They're a good outfit. Okay. Good to know. Um okay, so this is just an example of a soil amendment log that was uh, provided by the California Strawberry Commission. And so there's a couple of things. You have your date, recording your date applied, total quantity. So how was your material applied? So was it just, you know, broadcasted out on the field? Did you use some other method? Um, the source of the material? So 
Did you produce it? Did you get it from someone else? Um, what is the physical makeup? So what's the composition of that material? Um, was that information provided to you or do you know? So <coughs> this is one example of a soil amendment log that can be used. It's also in your packet. Um, and then this one is a pathogen reduction checklist for composted soil. Um, so they do have a category here, so material added. So, you know, did you add poultry manure, dried leaves, kitchen waste, straw? You should be aware of everything that's been added to your compost pile or your composting system. Um, or if you got it from someone, you should know the producer, the contact info, and still the material that was added. And then they have a date applied. And so um, all of these are, are basically the same questions that were asked before. Um, you know, were daily readings registered at 131 degrees Fahrenheit? Did it remain uh, for that long, 15 days or longer for windrow composting? Um, and so all of these are kind of a checklist for someone to be, okay, yes, 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 we did this, yes. Um, and then microbiological testing, yes or no. Uh, and this is another checklist for recording temperature. So I, this one is the one I'm not a fan of because, um, and I'm gonna show another one in just a minute that I don't have in your packet, I apologize, but it is available at the National GAPS, on the National GAPS website. But um, this one just has one temperature that you can take on a given day at one temperature field. And then most of the time, um, if you're producing your own compost and maybe you're not a, a composter, um, CO2 levels and moisture are gonna be something you're probably not going to record. Um, so temperature is really the most important. So this is the one that I actually like. <laughs> um, and so this is kind of the difference in the National GAPS program and the Strawberry Commission is that this one has, it's more of an all, it has more of the information that I think is the most relevant. So, you know, type of composting method, the ingredients that were added, um, date, date piled, and then all the dates that you turn it, so you can keep track of it. And then really you should test multiple areas of your compost pile because your temperature is not gonna be heterogeneous throughout the whole pile. And so if you just test one and say, yep, you know, 131 degrees right there, it doesn't mean that it's going to be that way throughout. And so it's good to know kind of the, the range of temperatures that could be in different areas of this pile. Okay. And I don't have that one in your packet again, I'm sorry. Um, but it is available and I have the website posted uh, at the end. So next up, agricultural water sources. I, I need to say something I think here. I'm, I'm a master composter and we talk, <laughs> we talk about temperatures. I also have a bit of a dairy background okay. and we talk about pasteurization. And, you know, my background, we have also talked about E. coli. E. coli is an indicator that something pooped. Yeah. And, you know, you've taken statistics and you get into the type 1, type 2 statistical error. And without getting too difficult with this, we pasteurize milk <coughs> just in case. We're assuming salmonella. E. coli, whatever is in the milk. We pasteurize it to kill pathogens. Yes. And the definition of pasteurization is killing pathogens, not killing all stuff, just pathogens. And I'm, I'm just thinking that's an awful lot of paperwork and there's a lot of inaccuracies. As you say, the pile is cold here, hot there, and no matter how many times you turn, there's still that little spot right there that, that didn't work. And I'm, I'm thinking, uh, you are, if you're gonna use compost, you're gonna use manure, you're gonna contaminate the product, plain and simple. And that's how I would address this. And then the issue is, there's a strawberry. I don't wanna cook my strawberry. Mm -hmm. and, you know, if I processed it into 
like you said, frozen strawberries where you cook them, add lots of sugar or salt or vinegar or whatever, then you get away from these issues. But I'm, I'm thinking there's a lot of paperwork and it's still inaccurate. Well, I mean, I, I do understand that. And if you do add manure, I mean, they do say, you know, at least three months yeah. of composting. And I think they've also, and I, I know with raw manure, you, if you apply it to a field, you have to wait a year before planting. Um, I do believe that composting would kill pathogens. You're right, there is never a zero, zero risk, right? right? Um, and we know that. I mean, I think consumers would like to say that they would like to see like zero risk related to any food product they're consuming, but that's not feasible. But you can take steps to reduce it to a level of risk that I think right. is acceptable. Well, it, you know, it's like pigs, you know, you always cook pork well. Yes. You know, you don't get, you don't order medium rare ham. You always cook pork because of protozoa the critters or whatever works uh, but at the same time what you're saying you don't feed them garbage you don't feed the pigs garbage because if you feed them garbage or raw meat or whatever then you're likely to infect them so you're you know you just assume they're infected just look back to yes there is always the assumption like there was no assumption that this product or compost or anything is completely pathogen free right. ever Yes. You know, that's, so you, that's the idea care of it. I'm sorry. I, uh, I just want to say this idea behind the good agricultural practices movement in the first place is to increase, I, it's my understanding, was to increase awareness. And the more people that do the more of the right things, it's going to decrease the risk. And as you say, we're not going to take it completely away, but we can reduce it a whole lot, I think, just by education, just exactly what we're doing here. Yeah. And right. get the word out. Well, it's, it's like labeling, you know cook the meat. You know, I, I assume all eggs have salmonella. To me that's a given. And I, I have a real problem going into a restaurant watching the guy crack the egg and then handle the, the bread. And you are well educated about this. It's, uh, most of the population is not. Right. Most of the population doesn't even think about it. No. You know, and they, they don't understand pathogens and they don't understand their reservoirs. And so, I mean, that's one of the aspects of my research or my program is really to start educating the consumer on what they can do to protect themselves and to take some responsibility. Because right now, I think all the responsibility and liability is on the grower <laughs> or the farmer, um, which is unfortunate, but yeah. that's the type of country that's we're good. in. Absolutely. So, okay. So we will go into agricultural water sources. So you need to know your water supply, of course, I'm sure all of you do. Um, it can be a source of pathogens, a vehicle for spreading microbial contaminants. So with irrigation water, you need to identify it and document it, like everything else I've been talking about. So um, usually there is a, you have a primary and a secondary source of water, uh, water um, for irrigation. You have different delivery systems. So in strawberry production, I'm under the assumption that most people use drip irrigation. Correct me if I'm wrong. Does anyone use any of these other methods for strawberry production? Burrow, flood, no, right? Overhead, I would think would be a big no-no. Um, they actually, well, they usually are near uh, uh, overhead sprinkle Bef irrigation for frost protection. Yeah, bef uh, but before fruit. Are. Well, yeah, generally speaking, mostly to save the flowers. Yeah. But they do use over there for that. For that purpose, but it's not when you have fruit that is no, ripening. No, no, no. Yeah. yeah. So your backyard, backyard farmer would more likely be using over there. Oh, yeah, yeah, I use a hose yeah. <laughs> to, yeah. to water my garden, and there are strawberries, but I'm eating them, so I'm accepting risk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's, yeah, so I mean, um, but in general, I guess most people use drip irrigation. So usually the the risk from the irrigation water um, delivery system in this instance for strawberries is probably pretty minimal. Um, you know, do you use the filtration system to clean your water? Uh, I'm not sure if any of you all do um, or what your main water sources are, if they're municipal water sources or groundwater, do you, in general, or surface water, what do you all use mostly for irrigation strawberries? A lot of the growers I feel are either doing either city water 
they are close by or they are using uh, well. Yeah, I mean, those, those are the two I would assume, but I don't, you know, I don't want to make any assumptions. I want you guys to tell me whether, you know. So in that instance, with well water and, and municipal water, a filtration system is not going to be necessary, unless for some reason with your municipal water source you're wanting to remove chlorine and then you would be using some type of, type of carbon filter to just remove the chlorine. But other than that, you probably wouldn't need a filtration system. Um, you always want to test the source, so annually or quarterly, depending on the source. So annually, you would say um, your capped, covered uh, groundwater wells, you would only test once a year. Um, for uncapped or open canals, you would test quarterly. I personally think that's not enough, but quarterly is what's recommended. Um, I would probably test monthly, and if you did have a, a huge rain event or flooding, I would test immediately after that until um, you were satisfied with the results, because I could guarantee you that you're going to have an elevated level of, of like E. coli or fecal coliforms. Um, you also have pesticides and foliar feed applications. Um, you should use potable water for crop protection sprays. Uh, you know, some research and studies have found, like, and it could be in other countries or depending on the production system, that people use a lesser uh, quality water for these sprays because there may be an assumption that the fungicides, insecticides, pesticides will maybe kill the pathogens that are present in that water. Um, that is not the case. So you would still use the same primary irrigation water that's treated for your crop um, protection sprays. Uh, of course, the same way you document the water source, you test the water, um, every time you spray, you would rinse clean tanks um, after each use. And I just provided a little info on a study that was done saying that pesticide spraying may spread norovirus. Um, this was just showing that if you put norovirus in a um, ready to use, made up, uh, I think it was like seven or eight different types of pesticides or fungicides, norovirus survives. And so that is not a way to, to kill norovirus or any pathogen um, if you use a questionable water source. So keeping that in mind. And I did provide that article if you wanted to read a little bit further about the study. Um, also be aware of water contamination, contamination risk from adjacent land. We've been talking about this, runoff or leaching. Um, risk should be identified. Um, so you should always, again, look around what's going on. Are there landfill sites nearby? Are they upslope or downslope? Um, sewage treatment facilities. So if you are downstream of a sewage treatment facility that releases their treated wastewater into surface water source and you use that surface water for any aspect of your production system, that water could be contaminated with pathogens. And I say this because sewage treatment is designed to do two things. It's a, uh, designed to decrease nutrients and decrease bacterial loads. It does nothing against viruses. So treated wastewater has been tested, treated wastewater, effluent water has been tested and they have shown significant levels of viruses that can cause disease that are released <coughs> into the environment into these surface waters. So being aware if you do have a sewage treatment plant upstream from you and you use that water source is important. Um, septic tanks, so leaking septic tanks, um, depending on the groundwater structure and in this area, I know that we have more of a karst system, you can have issues with leaching um, into your groundwater, uh, potential runoff uh, from adjacent farming operations again. So some corrective actions, you could um, construct physical barriers. So if you do have a lot of flow in from another area, you have ditches, berms, uh, fencing. Um, if you know that you have neighbors or nearby places with leach fields or septic tanks that aren't operating properly, properly disinfecting your well may not be a bad idea. Um, also, um, catch ponds are another um, way to control water inflow. Um, again, I'm showing this to remind you, so to do microbiological testing, you would use a sterile sample bottle. Um, you have to allow the water to, uh, you cannot allow the water to flow over any object or your hands into the bottle. It must go directly from whatever the source is into the bottle to prevent any contamination. Um, if you're using municipal water or tap water, you turn it on, allow it to flush for two to three minutes before collecting. Um, 
you deliver the sample on ice to a testing lab as soon as you can. But the um, recommendation was no more than 30 hours after. I would disagree with this. I worked in a water quality testing lab, and normally um, you would want the sample to be tested within six hours um, for drinking water. Now, if it's another source, I think they may have said overnight, so technically 24 hours, but we tested them almost immediately. So the sooner the better, um, I would say. What, what would be the problem? Would you get an extra high reading or an extra low reading? You could, time. you could have degradation of your microorganisms depending on how they were stored. Um, if you did have temperature abuse and you didn't put them on ice, you could have elevated levels. Right. Um, so if you're, you know, if you're not following a proper procedure in I'm putting them on ice. I'm assuming this is refrigerated at 40 degrees or whatever. Yes. So, so you shouldn't have any issues. Should be stable. Should be stable. But after a period of time, you may have a slightly lower level but um, you're not gonna have a huge die off of the organisms if they're stored at, at four degrees Celsius or 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so this was another checklist that was provided by um, the California uh, Strawberry Commission. And um, it basically is having you go through and saying, for all of these different sources of water that I use in my farm, primary, secondary, uh, pesticide application, hand washing, drinking water, where are they coming from? Here, yes, no, you just identify them. And then for um, irrigation water, what is your method of, um, <coughs> is it drip, is it overhead? And then this recycled water was, I think is very specific to California because as you know, they, they have a water shortage, not that we don't hear, but I didn't go into recycled water and, and how you should treat it and what you should do. But this document does have information on that if you wanted to find out more um, if you're using recycled water in any way. Um, you know, recording dates that you tested water. So your tap wells, like I said, annually. Other um, uncapped open water sources quarterly. Municipal water, you can just get it from the, the drinking water district or um, treatment plant. Uh, if you did have an issue, what did you do? So all of these basically, again, recording and documenting what's going on and how you're taking action to correct it to reduce the risk of contamination. Okay, we're getting close. I know you guys are hungry, so. <laughs> um, the next topic is wildlife management. And so I don't know if you all are aware of this website. It's called Food Safety News. I think it's a really interesting website. It talks about food safety domestically around the world, outbreaks and different issues. Sometimes they're just opinion pieces and blogs. So uh, you can sign up for daily emails. I like it um, if you wanted to find out just more about what's going on in food safety. So in 2011, there was an outbreak with strawberries. Does anyone know about this outbreak? It happened in Oregon. Um, basically, they found that deer droppings were the source of E. coli at 157H7, so one of those sects. Um, contamination of strawberry fields um, at Jackwith, I'm assuming that's how you say it, farm in Oregon. There were 15 illnesses and one death. But what happened was the farm sold to a distributor that sold to another person that sold at a roadside stand. So it's kind of really hard to backtrack and say, where did this come from? But they did find, yes, it was because of deer droppings. And these berries were harvested um, probably, I, I don't know if they were really aware that they were deer droppings, but if they weren't aware, <laughs> they should look closer, um, which is where this is gonna head. So uh, with monitoring and figuring out, you know, do you have wildlife intrusion and what can you do about it? And I'm not gonna go too much in detail because there is someone talking about exclusion um, after lunch. So um, we did talk about already that wild animals are reservoirs for these bacterial pathogens. So I'm just gonna go through a few outbreaks to kind of put it in perspective again. In 1996, in California, apples were contaminated because deer got into the field. Um, they uh, uh, pooped, defecated um, on the ground, and that's where dropped apples were. But these dropped apples were used for making apple cider or apple juice, and they were unpasteurized. <laughs> so, kind of a perfect storm. And basically, there was a multi state outbreak of this sect due to this unpasteurized apple juice because it was used from apples that were off the ground that had been exposed to deer droppings. Um, this is another infamous one, the spinach outbreak in 2006. Um, 
I don't think there is still consensus on the actual contamination, but the thought is that feces from cattle and feral pigs, they both carried the strain of E. coli that, was, that caused the outbreak. Um, they got into the fields and contaminated the spinach. Um, this was an interesting one to me, and this is a kind of uh, highlighting the unique reservoirs that can be out there. Um, in 2008, in Alaska, raw peas were contaminated with Campylobacter, which I have not talked about. It's another pathogen, but it's mostly associated with um, chicken and uh, unpasteurized raw milk products. Um, Sandhill cranes had a field day in the snow pea field, um, defecated. Campylobacter was in their feces, and these peas that were eaten raw were contaminated. So um, know your reservoirs or potential wildlife reservoirs is the take home message there. Okay, so the question really is how significant is this food safety risk? So they've found or researchers have shown that low levels of these pathogens are in deer. So you think, well, low levels, it's probably not going to be an issue. However, Stex, and I'm going to qualify this, specifically sugar toxin producing E. coli, do have a low infectious dose, similar to that dose I was talking about with viruses. So 10 to 100 um, can cause an illness. So this low infectious dose does mean there's a low, the low level can pose a risk. Um, you also have salmonella and campylobacter that are much more common, especially among wild birds. But these other, what I would say, you know, pests, wildlife that can come into your fields are also reservoirs. Field mice, deer mice, raccoons, possums, they all carry these pathogens. And so knowing what is around and coming into your um, farm is really important. Um, so this is a little example of how an initial contamination event in the field may later amplify due to the downstream failures. So if you do have temperature abuse, <coughs> you know, the custom product, those bacteria that are um, have been inoculated onto that product can increase in number and then cause that issue of um, causing an illness or an outbreak. So what you should do, and there are again lovely checklists that I will go through that you can use, and these are the ones from the National GAPS website, but you have a, you would do an environmental risk assessment. So pre-season, are you near wooded areas that lots of grazing animals, or not grazing, but you know, wildlife would be in, deer. Um, are you near water sources that are kind of a gathering place for wildlife? Uh, Pre-harvest, so before, right before you harvest, you would look for any feces or affected crop, anything that is, is coming from wildlife, and you don't harvest it. You flag it, and you move on. <clears throat> Monitor for animal intrusion during growth and harvest. So I'll show you the form on how you would, kind of an example of how you would monitor during growth. Um, corrective actions, I'm not gonna go into this because someone's gonna talk about it, but these are a few of them, fencing, decoys, noise cannons, which aren't supposed to be very effective anyways. Um, removal of water bodies, which is an issue with <laughs> environmental, Department of Environmental Quality, quality so not the best idea, but it has been done um, in nuisance permits. So. Uh, Arkansas Game and Fish Commission, they'll issue a nuisance permit if you need to get rid of some deer on your property. Um, and again, this is on the GAPS uh, website for Cornell. So this is a log of how you would do a pre-plant assessment. And so I can read this. You have this in your packet as well, so you can look along because I know it's hard to read. Um, <clears throat> so you do this before you plant. Um, the first question is, you know, are pastures located upslope? The next one, you know, are you nearby water bodies? This all the questions I was asking before. Uh, what lands are close by? And this, the reason why I like the gaps is because they actually give you an example of how to fill the form out. So what did you observe? What are you gonna do about it? What was the date? And so these are just basic things you can do before you actually plant. The next form is monitoring. So you should really be monitoring your field throughout production and harvest. And so this is saying, okay, this is a field that I'm looking at. Uh, yeah, there were a few deer tracks. No, I, I didn't really see any, I didn't see fecal material, so there's probably not a risk. That was kind of the, the steps that are taken. Um, and then pre-harvest, same thing. You're gonna look for evidence or observation of animals in the field, fecal material, 
if there is fecal material, is it in contact with your product? If not, maybe it's not an issue. But if it's in close proximity, maybe you err on the side of caution and just get rid of that product. Um, do areas of no harvest need to be established? So you've monitored and you have people coming in to harvest or you're harvesting and you need to flag those areas and say, no, these products are not going to be put into the same batch as the rest of the products that are going to market. Okay, I'm almost there. So, uh, field and packing house workers. So field sanitation, oh, sorry, let me go back really quick. The other thing I added in your packet that I don't have up here because it's an extensive document is a decision tree on how to manage wildlife, okay? And so I think it's this is also available on the GAPS website. I think we have lots of great material, but I think this is really useful to help have you go through in each step of what you need to be aware of and looking for when you're trying to manage wildlife and animal um, intrusion. Okay, so field sanitation. So the facilities, they need to be clean, accessible, the same that you would expect for yourself. Um, previously I asked if a lot of people had folks come in and harvest for them or you paid people to come in. Is that the case with you all or do you mostly harvest yourself? The berries. Yes, no? Yes. <coughs> Uh, yeah, people. Yeah, people. And so, um, you know, they need to be provided with the facilities um, to go to the bathroom. Um, they should be. They should not be located near um, sources of irrigation water. If it's say a portable, like porta pot, um, you know, common sense. Don't clean the portable toilet on the field. Um, take it out and have it done. Uh, you know, you should have wash water tanks for hand washing. If you have a large production and that facility is more than a five minute walk away, you have to provide something on the field for them to use and to wash their hands. Um, well, it's not required, it's recommended, I should say. <laughs> so um, so the, I think the rule is if it's more than a five minute walk, something else needs to be provided. Oh, sorry. This is super tiny and it's in your packet, but I will just point out a few things on here. Um, you know, the basics is toilet paper provided. Some people will get creative and <laughs> use other things. Um, toilet and hand washing facilities in close proximity to each other. So if someone has to walk a really long way to wash their hands, I guarantee you they will just bypass that step and go right back to what they're doing. Um, and this is where it says, uh, for workers convenience, located within one quarter mile walk or with one five, within one five minute, whichever is shorter. The other thing is health and hygiene. So workers should be trained on good hygiene and you should document that training. If you don't use workers, then this really isn't applicable to you, but maybe you will hire a few, who knows, undergrad students or local people, and you know you may assume that they know about good hand washing, but they may not. And so providing them with a little bit of um, information, it doesn't have to be an all day training, it could be 20 minutes of this is how you wash your hands. Um, Hand washing is a factor in keeping food clean. It is the single most important factor, and I say that without reservation, almost. Um, you should remind people daily of the importance of washing hands. You should document the policy that you have on maintaining your hand washing facilities. Um, show people how to properly wash their hands, and do not provide hand sanitizers. They are not a replacement. You can only use them if you wash your hands and then if you want some extra protection for whatever reason, use a hand sanitizer. But it does not absolutely nothing. And I can provide you more information about that if you want. But um, a lot of research has shown that it just basically moves stuff around. It's really not getting rid of anything. <coughs> okay, last little part, um, packing and storage containers. This to me is very much common sense. Uh, your primary containers that your barrier your product is going in should not touch the soil. So your clamshells and your pine containers, um, you know, pest control. So those mice and the birds and everything, um, those procedures, you know, procedures should be in place to prevent any type of animal intrusion that would happen in storage. Um, always check your condition of the pallets if you have large pallets for your strawberries um, that you're using. And this is just showing some different, I guess, strawberry harvesting techniques. So they have these little stands with a, a kind of a crate and then the boxes or the primary containers on top. Um, the other one, what about consumers or visitors? So how many people have you pick 
type operations. Yes, okay. So, um, I think this is okay, and this is more geared towards maybe not your basic consumer or visitor, but I think you could, you could uh, adjust it to be applicable. But the first one, if you are ill, go home. Come back another day because if that person has an incident in your bathroom or you know doesn't quite make it from the field or they haven't been washing their hands and they're touching berries and picking things and maybe they didn't want that berry so they're gonna go get another berry. Um, I think that it's really important um, to just say, look, if you've been sick, vomiting diarrhea, you know, maybe you should go home. Um, and I know that's hard to do, but at least if you provided some information where you're not telling them, but it's there, they may be like, oh, maybe I shouldn't pick berries today. Um, and then there's a lot of other just hygiene things listed on here. Obviously, pets are not allowed. Service animals are an exception, but maybe you should limit their access to the field and just have them in an area where you don't have um, ready-to-harvest product. Uh, and then also in your packet, I provided safe handling of fresh strawberries for consumers. This is from Texas Cooperative Extension out of Texas A&M, but I think it would be a great idea for you as a person who is providing your product to consumers or if they're coming to your farm to pick, to provide them with some information about how they can safely handle and wash that product once they get it home. And so one of the things they do is they say, first, wash your hands with hot soapy water for 20 seconds. Next, <laughs> place the berries in a clean and sanitized container. You know, and they provide just information. So this is in your packet. And so I don't know if, if our extension provides anything like this, Alina, but I think it would be great to have probably a shorter information sheet to say, you know, put in that little berry thing. Steve might have something. Okay. Yeah. Well, I don't know if it's available on the website or. <coughs> okay. The Oklahoma Call Department, the FCS, has produced a series of sheets on something like that. Arkansas Fresh, I think. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. So, I mean, even like, so is it, are you, you know, it would be good for you to just maybe provide the consumer with the actual sheet or unless you're relying on the consumer to actually find it, I don't know. So, um,. Yeah, so providing some information on how they can properly handle it is handle berries is a good idea. Whether they follow it or not, I don't know. Um, that's another question altogether. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about this, but basically, and I'm just going to go, um, this study, um, I won't go into too much detail, but basically they're saying that foodborne and zoonotic viruses um, were found on irrigated field grown strawberries, and they compared irrigation and they compared the mulch straw versus plastic and basically they found that it didn't seem to matter and 18 of 60 strawberry samples were positive for viruses. So um, I just wanted to highlight that the risk is there regardless of your irrigation method. But they suspected it was the irrigation water that they couldn't, I don't think their sample size was large enough to show spray between spray and drip. So. Production systems, and I'm going to hold off on talking about specific risks, but you can imagine that conventional systems that are in open fields have a higher risk than, say, high tunnel and low tunnel, which have a higher risk than hydroponic, <laughs> and just in general. And the next phase, if it gets funded, we'll be looking more specifically at doing a quantitative microbial risk assessment <coughs> of each of these systems. Again, um, the GAPS website is great. They have these wonderful decision trees for every aspect of your food safety plan. I highly recommend going and exploring. Uh, if you have questions, please contact me. My info is in your packet. Wash your hands, please. And these are the resources that I use. So thank you for your attention. And I know I went over a little bit, but um, hopefully you learned something today. So. Thank you very much. Um, Caroline, do you have uh, something to say about lunch? Um, um, lunch? Can you? Yeah. Lunch is not in my what we had yesterday. It's not quite as uh, um, neatly packaged. So your sandwich is in there. It's got potato chips thrown in it.